Welcome to the presentation on distance bounds for high-dimensional consistent digital rays and two-dimensional partially consistent digital rays. My name is Martin Suderland and I'm presenting you joint work with Man Quinn Shu, Matthias Korman and Takeshi Tokuyama. Euclidean line segments are one of the most fundamental geometric objects. They have many interesting properties such as that the intersection of two segments is again a segment. The definition of other mathematical concepts heavily depends on the definition of segments, such as convex regions. Representing Euclidean segments in a digital world is a challenging task. The most common approach is to do the rounding. Unfortunately, many interesting properties can get lost. On the left-hand side, you can see two Euclidean segments that intersect in one point. On the right hand side we rounded those Euclidean segments and now they intersect in three disconnected components. We look for constructions of digital line segments such that the analogous of Euclidean axioms are satisfied and they visually look similar to their Euclidean counterparts. Digital line segments have applications in image segmentation. We call a set of digital segments consistent if they satisfy the following five axioms for every pair of grid points P and Q. The digital segment PQ is a path from P to Q through grid points such that the distance between two consecutive grid points on that path has exactly distance of 1. The digital segment from P to Q is the same one as the digital segment from Q to P. For any grid point R on the digital segment from P to Q, it has to hold that the digital segment from P to R is a subset of the digital segment from P to Q. Every digital segment can be extended. That means that any digital segment is a subset of a bigger digital segment. If the start and the end point of a digital segment have the same coordinate, then all the grid points on this digital path must have the same coordinate. These five axioms have important implications. We mentioned the first one already before, namely that the intersection of two segments is another segment. Moreover, we can also conclude that the intersection of a segment with an axis aligned half space is again a segment. An example of consistent digital segments is given on the bottom. The start and the end point of a digital segment are connected through an L shape. Ideally, digital segments should look similar to Euclidean segments. This similarity is measured by the Hausdorff distance. In our example before with the L shaped digital segments, the Hausdorff error is unfortunately big. Even though our final goal is to have a construction of consistent digital line segments that connect any pair of grid points, we now restrict our attention to segments that start from the origin and connect it to any other grid point. Such a set of digital segments is called consistent digital rays. The set of such segments forms a tree. An example is given below. Moreover, we only consider the first authent, because if we have a CDR for the first authent, then by rotating copies of it, we can fill out the remaining space. Finally, we limit our domain to grid points whose sum of coordinates is at most capital N. We call this domain Gn. The set of grid points whose coordinate sum equals n is called the nth layer. Previous work was mostly focused to two dimensions. Luby in 1987 introduced the topic of consistent digital segments and gave a construction with an upper house of error bound of log n. In the same paper, there is also a matching error lower bound given which was derived by Hastad. 
Many years later, the topic was rediscovered again. In 2016, Chattery and Gibson describe an algorithm which constructs a CDR which contains a given set of segments. The results in higher dimensions are sparse. In 2009, Chan et al. gave a construction of consistent digital rays in d-dimensional space with an log n upper arrow bound. Very recently, Chu and Korman gave a construction of infinitely many CDRs with a log n error and infinitely CDSs with a linear error. So far, no lower bound for the Hausdorff error of CDRs in higher dimensions was known, and we addressed this issue in this paper. On the left hand side, we see a CDR in three dimensions, and on the right hand side, we see the cross-section of the CDR with a horizontal plane through the origin. This cross-section is not a CDR in two dimensions, because the prolongation property is not satisfied. The digital segments from the origin to point A and B do not extend. Therefore, the log n lower error bound does not directly hold for higher dimensional CDRs. We are still interested in these sets of digital segments, which only violate the prolongation property, and call those weak CDRs. Each vertex that does not extend, like the vertices A and B in the example, is called an inner leaf. In our paper, we derived two main results on CDRs. The first result is about weak CDRs with kappa many inner leaves, and it derives a lower Hausdorff error bound of n log n divided by n plus kappa. Based on the first result, we managed to derive an error bound for the Hausdorff error of CDRs in d-dimensional space. Before I can sketch the proofs for those two theorems, we have to do a detour to a at first sight seemingly unrelated topic. One of the questions in discrepancy theory is the following one. How uniformly can we distribute a set of n points in the unit square? Below I have given two examples on the left hand side, points arranged on a grid, and on the right hand side, points randomly sampled in the unit square. We answer the previous question with the following concept. For any set P of points in the unit square and numbers X and Y in the unit interval, we define P of X, Y to be the number of points in the intersection of P and the cross product of the interval 0X and 0Y. The discrepancy of set P at point x, y is then defined as the number of points in p times x times y minus p of x, y. Intuitively, the first part of the formula corresponds to the expected number of points in p that are in the rectangle defined by the intervals 0x and 0y. In the second part, we subtract the actual number of points in P that fall into this rectangle. An example is given in the right figure. There you can see a grey rectangle that covers one-fourth of the area of the unit square. Therefore we would expect one-fourth of the points in P to fall into this rectangle, which would be 4. The actual number of points in that rectangle is 3. Therefore, the discrepancy equals 1 at this point x0, y0. Finally, the discrepancy of a point set is defined as the highest discrepancy that can be achieved among all possible rectangles. In 1972, Schmidt derived a lower bound on the discrepancy of a point set in the unit square, which increases logarithmically in a number of points. This lower bound is tight, 
as there are examples like the van der Korput sequence and Holton Hammersley sets that achieve this discrepancy. We generalize the previous discrepancy result for our purposes to two colors. Let R and B be a set of red and blue points in the unit square. We defined the discrepancy of R and B at point XY to be the expected difference between the number of blue and red points in the rectangle spanned by XY minus the actual difference between the number of blue and red points in that rectangle. The discrepancy of the red and blue point sets is then defined as the highest discrepancy that can be achieved among all the rectangles. In the example above, we have 12 blue points and 4 red points. The grey rectangle covers one fourth of the area of the unit square, and therefore we would expect it to have two more blue points than red points. Actually, the difference of blue and red points is 3. Therefore, the discrepancy for this point x0, y0 is minus 1. The discrepancy of the red and blue point sets is defined as the highest discrepancy that can be achieved for any rectangle. In our paper, we derive the lower bound for the discrepancy of red and blue points. Our lower discrepancy bound is sharp for both the cases where the number of red points is zero, which corresponds to the monochromatic case, and also the case where the number of red points equals the number of blue points. Here it is easy to construct an example with a matching discrepancy by choosing the red points to be the same as the blue points. We use the discrepancy result to prove properties of the CDRs. But we also believe that the discrepancy result is of independent interest. I am now going to sketch the proofs of our two main CDR results. In order to compute a lower bound, for the Hausdorff error of CDRs in higher dimensions, we first compute the cross-section with a horizontal plane. This gives us a weak CDR in two dimensions. We will describe a transformation that maps a weak CDR in two dimensions to a two-colored point set in a unit square. If the weak CDR has few inner leaves, then the point sets in the unit square have few red points. Our discrepancy result then tells us that there is a point in the unit square which has a high discrepancy. Such a point then leads us to a digital segment in the weak CDR with a high house of error. Before we can describe this transformation from a weak CDR to a point set in the unit square, we need some definitions. We define a function m, which maps every grid point in our domain to the unit interval. The points in the last layer are mapped to equidistant values between 0 and 1, as shown in the example below. For a subtree of the CDR, we define its maximum and minimum. The maximum is defined as the maximum value of m that can be achieved for grid points in this tree symmetrically as for the minimum. In the example below, the minimum of the tree T is 3 quarters and the maximum is 1. For any inner leaf, we consider the previous and next vertex in the same layer. We define the value of M for this inner leaf to be the arithmetic mean of the maximum of the tree rooted at the previous vertex and the minimum of the tree rooted at the next vertex. In our example, the value of m for the inner leaf is the arithmetic mean of a half and three quarters, which equals 5 8. The function m defined so far satisfies some monotonicity property. Let u and v be vertices of the same layer, such that u is to the left of v. Then the maximum of the tree rooted at u 
is smaller than the minimum of the tree rooted at V. In the example below, the maximum of the tree rooted at U is 5 eighths, whereas the minimum of the tree rooted at V is 3 quarters. We say the depth of a tree is the longest possible length of a path from its root to any of its leaves. In the example below, the orange tree has a depth of 3. We call a vertex of degree 3 a split vertex. Any split vertex has two branching edges, each defining a subtree. The subtree of higher depth is the preferred one of the split vertex. In case of a tie, the subtree to the right is the preferred one. In the example below, the orange subtree of S is the preferred one. For any grid point in our domain, we define a walk from the point to a leaf of our CDR. If the point has a degree 2, then we follow the single edge to the next layer. If the point is a split vertex, we follow the edge to the preferred subtree, and we continue this process until we finally reach a leaf, which we call gamma of p. If p has degree 2, then we define m of p as the value of m at the leaf gamma of p. For a split vertex S, let S bar be the child of S that is not on the preferred subtree. We then define M of S to be the value of M at the leaf gamma of S bar. In the example below, we start from the split vertex S and initially follow the non-preferred subtree upwards. After the first step, we follow the preferred subtrees of higher depth until we reach the leaf which has two quarters as value of m. The function m induces a bijection between the split vertices and the leaves. For any split vertex there exists a unique leaf such that the values of m coincide for the split vertex and the leaf. And for any leaf except for the one on the x-axis there exists a unique split vertex such that again the values of m coincide. In the example below, the split vertices and their corresponding leaves are shown in the same color. We map a weak CDR into a bicolored point set in the unit square in the following way. Each vertex in our domain is mapped to a point whose x-coordinate is the function m of this vertex and the y-coordinate depends on the layer in which the vertex is in. Each inner leaf creates a red point, and each split vertex creates a blue point in the unit square. In the example below, you can see a CDR with five split vertices and one inner leaf, which is mapped to a point set with five blue points and one red point. Given a vertex V in a CDR, its x-coordinate is directly related to the difference between blue and red points in a rectangle spanned by the image of vertex V. In the bottom example, I have highlighted the vertex of the CDR with a green circle, and I call it V. It has 6 as x coordinate. I have highlighted V's image in the unit square also with a green circle. This point spans a rectangle which contains 11 blue points and 3 red points. The difference between the two colors is 8, which coincides up to plus minus 2 with the x-coordinate of v, which was 6. We have now all the tools to derive the lower bound for 2D big CDRs. We start with the blue and red points in the unit square. Our discrepancy result tells us that there is a rectangle whose discrepancy is big. In our case, the interior of the rectangle does not contain any blue points. We map the corner point of the rectangle back to the CDR and call this point Q. From Q we follow the more preferred path until we reach a leaf, which we call P. Roughly speaking, the x-coordinate of point Q is small because the difference 
of blue and red points in the rectangle was small too. On the other hand, the x-coordinate of point P is big because the rectangle has a big area. The unbalanced x-coordinates between Q and P then induce a high Hausdorff error. Putting numbers into those thoughts then proves that any weak CDR in two dimensions, which has kappa inner leaves, has at least n log n divided by n plus kappa much Hausdorff error. So far we have shown that a CDR in higher dimensions could only have a small Hausdorff error if it has many inner leaves on the cross-section with the horizontal plane. Because of the prolongation property of CDRs, all of those inner leaves in the XY plane need to extend in other dimensions. If there are too many inner leaves in the XY plane, the rays emanating from those leaves cannot all stay close to the XY plane. This induces also a high house of error. We have seen that few inner leaves induce a high house of error in the XY plane, whereas many inner leaves induce a high error in all the other directions. If we balance both of those effects, we derive our theorem, which says that any CDR in d-dimensional space has at least d minus one root of log of n much host of error. It remains an open question in higher dimensions to close the gap between this lower bound and the upper log n bound. We would like to thank our friends and also the anonymous reviewers who helped us with their discussions and feedback. Thank you for your attention.